understanding member needs and motivation. This is Marilyn Scholl. We're very happy to have you all here with us today. I also want to welcome and thank uh, these people who are going to be joining us today. Um, Amy Holt is the board president of the Lexington Co-op in Buffalo, New York. Amy, would you say hello? Hello. And uh, uh, maybe a couple more words so people can get your voice. Oh, this is Amy. Um, great to be here. I look forward to this. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Kelly Smith, the director of uh, marketing and communications at the National Cooperative Grocers Association. Hi, this is Kelly. Thank you all for being here. And just to give you a little preview of our part of this conversation, will be uh, primarily given by Allison from Milkshake Media, and she'll be speaking next. Thanks, and Allison from Milkshake Media. Hi there, this is Allison Friend. Looking forward to talking about some interesting psychographics about uh, the co-op shopper. Thanks, Allison. And last but not least, we have Art Ames, the general manager of the Berkshire Co-op Market in Great Barrington, Mass. Hello, everybody. I'm the guy with the heavy Boston accent. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Art. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, all of you, for coming on and, and sharing your experience with the folks on the call. Um, this is the outline that we're going to follow today. Uh, we have, uh, have begun the introduction. Um, Mark has given you an explanation of how to ask questions or share your comments, how to participate. Is there anything else you'd like to add at this point, Mark? Uh, no, but um, uh, please do send in your questions and comments. We're looking forward to them. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we're looking at the outline now. Next, we'll look at the objectives. Uh, then we have two different ways of looking at member needs and motivations that we're going to be presenting today. The first one is a model that I've uh, worked on and developed called Levels of Involvement. And I'll give you a little overview of that. And then Amy will tell us about how they've used that at the Lexington Co-op. And then we'll stop and take your questions and comments. Next, we'll have um, information from NCGA about the research that they've conducted. Um, Allison and, and Kelly will share with us what they're learning. And uh, then we'll have another opportunity for a case study for Art to tell us a little bit about how he uses the um, NCGA research in, in leading uh, the, the Berkshire Co-op. Um, and then we'll take your questions and comments on that, and we'll save just a few minutes at the end to, to come back and let each participant um, give a little um, summary of the key points that they would like to, to share if they have any other or, or take any remaining questions that you have. So that's the, the outline. Here are the learning objectives. And we hope that directors of food co-ops have more resources for understanding different kinds of members and customers and their needs and motivations. We hope that you will be able to use the information that we're presenting to test your thinking and your decisions from distinct points of view so that after the workshop you'll be able to put yourselves in the, in the position and the seats, uh, the footsteps of different kinds of members and imagine um, their voices in the room and helping you make good decisions and, um, and see the impact of your uh, board decision. Um, we also hope that you're able to uh, find new ways to develop member uh, linkage and member communication plans and strategies, um, both to increase the number of activities, uh, things that you could try, and the effectiveness of those activities and strategies. And uh, lastly, to see that uh, as directors, as, as people who are actively and passionately involved in the co-op, that you may be different from many of other members, and so that that's uh, useful for you to see those differences so that you're able to represent the entirety of the membership and not just people like you. So that's what we hope to accomplish. Um, moving right on into the first part of the presentation, the uh, the levels of involvement model that um, I've worked on is based on the uh, hierarchy of needs developed by Maslow. Uh, Maslow did a lot of work in the early part of the 20th century at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, he spent uh, decades and decades uh, studying humans and, and primates and developing his model, his understanding of uh, 
how people's needs are met. And what he found was that human needs are arranged in a hierarchy from the most pressing, uh, represented on the pyramid here at the bottom, to the least pressing. So people have um, their needs, their hunger and thirst, their physiological needs, and that those are their most pressing needs. As those needs get met, they we move on as humans to higher level needs, needs for safety and and protection. And as those are needs, as those needs are met, we move on to higher level needs, our um, social needs, sense of belonging and love. Following that are needs for self-esteem and recognition. And then at the top of the pyramid is our need for self-actualization and growth and development. And that as humans, uh, when a need is satisfied, it ceases to be a motivator. And then we move on to the next higher level of need, uh, trying to get our, our satisfaction at that level. There are some shortcomings to the model. I think no model is really perfect, and I don't present it here as, a, as the end all and be all. But just a way of, of expanding our thinking, uh, one of the shortcomings is that as human beings, we're sometimes messy, and we, we move um, in between levels uh, in unexpected ways. Sometimes more than one level of need can cause a motivation at the same time. And as humans, if we uh, move, try trying to seek satisfaction at a higher level uh, but, are, but are becoming unsatisfied there, we can become frustrated and regress to a lower level. So the, the basics here are that all humans have the needs at the bottom and, and seek to meet those. As we move up to the, up the pyramid, there are fewer humans in each category who have been able to accomplish their needs, to satisfy their needs at the lower levels, and uh, are able to move up. So I took this model of Maslow and just broke it down into a, just maybe some simpler stages and said at the bottom we have our basic economic and physical needs, the, the, the bottom layer and maybe halfway up through the second layer. And as those are met, we have more of our social needs come out, our, our needs to be part of community. And then um, as we move on, on up, our more philosophic or political needs uh, come out. So looking at this simpler version led me to think about different kinds of members and why some members are more involved in a food co-op and other members aren't involved uh, beyond shopping, and that's all they're really interested in. So just looking at, uh, at, at sorting out members' needs and motivations in a similar way to what Maslow was working on and thinking about in his work. And uh, I haven't done 40 years of research like Maslow did, and I haven't studied primates. This is uh, just some thoughts that I've put together based on um, my experience, I have worked with food crops for about 30 years, so just observations and experiences over that period of time. And um, just made some guesses at how, how they might, uh, how our members might spread out among this pyramid. And looked at, well, at the bottom, it might be people, customers, people who shop at the store, but aren't really interested in, in joining, becoming a member. Um, if they're not satisfied at that level, of course, they'll move on and go shop somewhere else. But if they are satisfied as a customer, they might very well be interested in moving on to a higher level. Some will, some won't. Some will be satisfied at, at staying at that uh, customer base. There's uh, been so, some research that indicates that uh, just around half of the people are not joiners. No matter what the organization, they, no matter how much they believe or, or support the organization, that there's a, a large segment of the population who are just not joiners, not willing to make that kind of commitment. So we'll probably always have a good portion of people at this bottom level, level the customer level, as long as we're meeting their needs by offering a great place to shop, a, a good environment uh, that we satisfy their needs there, they'll just stay. But there are others who will move on up and see some benefits of becoming a member of the co-op. They may first be, be most motivated by the 
just the benefits of, be, of um, belonging, maybe the tangible benefits of membership, like the um, patronage dividends, member specials, the uh, ability uh, to order uh, case lots. Whatever kinds of tangible benefits you have at, at your co-op may appeal to some of the economic needs that your members have, and they'll find those satisfying and, and want to join. In this model, I'm just calling those the shopping members. Moving on up, there may be members who join because they want to be a part of the co-op. They don't maybe care so much about the, the economic implications, the, um, um, the goals of the co-op per se, but, but they do like a sense of community. They want some community with their food, and so they, they join to get that sense of belonging, that sense of we that can come from being a part of the co-op. I'm calling those social members here. Then on up the, the pyramid is those needs are met if people are satisfied with their the shopping experience, if they're satisfied with the economic benefits for members, if they do gain a sense of community from the co-op, uh, they may begin to see that the co-op is also meeting some of their um, their philosophic or political goals as far as strengthening a community around cooperatively owned businesses, around recycling um, money in the community, around um, environmental issues, organic and local food production. Um, so as we move on up, um, people are really um, more engaged and more motivated by those kind of issues and understand those kind of issues. Uh, they may become even more involved and participate in, in activities such as um, uh, being involved with the newsletter, attending events, um, coming to the annual meeting, voting in elections. And then at the very top, uh, we have active owners, people who have been uh, presumably well satisfied at the earlier levels and want to be more actively involved. Uh, these are folks who, um, who are likely to, to serve on committees or be willing to run for the board of directors. To the extent that this model is, uh, follows the Maslow's uh, pyramid, um, it's to be assumed that the majority of the people are at the base and that as the benefits become more intangible going up the pyramid, that there will be fewer and fewer people. Another assumption that we might make is that those people who are at the top, uh, the active, most active of the members, uh, those people who are serving on the board of directors and in decision-making position very likely have very, very different needs and motivations from the people who are at the base, the customers and the shopping members. And so the, the decision-makers need to be aware of this difference and be careful that in their decision-making that they're recognizing that, that their needs and motivation may be quite different. For the co-op to survive as a business, we really need to be first meeting the needs of the customers and the shopping members. There's unlikely to be enough people involved at the co-op at the highest couple of levels to be able to sustain uh, a retail storefront. Looking at some of the goals of, of this model and why I think it's interesting to, uh, to think about it as a way of looking at members' needs is, is the importance of each person having a high degree of satisfaction with their level involvement. That there is easy access for members to change their level of involvement if they wish, either to become more involved or to become less involved. Um, certainly, the co-op needs enough people at the active level, enough to have strong and empowered leadership, that you have um, uh, not only a, a, a full and, and strong and dedicated board, um, but people who are in the pool of candidates for election to the board of directors and potentially able to step up and, uh, and run for election in the future. But it, it's also important that all levels of involvement are welcome and appreciated. The point of the of thinking about the model 
uh, from my point of view, is not to try to change the world, but to accept the world the way it is, to see it for what it is, to welcome people to get more involved, but to appreciate and respect whatever they choose, that each member has a right to choose for themselves how involved they want to be. So it's, it's not about uh, trying to change people, it's about trying to serve people and meet their needs. It is likely that the people at the top layers, just because of their greater um, involvement and, and their greater uh, commitment to the principles, are likely to be more vocal than the, than the shoppers and the customers and the shopping members. So it, it's important to keep in balance your view of, of where the in, entire population of the co-op um, resides and to attend to the, the comments and the needs of the vocal folks that you hear from, um, but also understand that they, they as well as you, may not represent the center, the, the, the base, the vast majority of the, of the customers. So just looking at it, at the model as a way of helping you keep balance among all the different categories. All of the members are important. All of them deserve to be heard. Um, but, but it's important to keep some sense of balance around the different kinds of members in different categories. Some of the ways that I think directors can use this model is to hear perspectives that might not otherwise become audible. And I've got here in quotation marks, meaning that you may not literally hear those voices of people who are really satisfied just shopping and uh, don't necessarily want to have higher levels of involvement. Um, but by understanding their position, you can figuratively hear them, not literally hear them, but bring their their voices and thoughts into the conversation by understanding that they are there and that they exist. Another use, I think, is, is to use the model to think about how decisions and actions made by uh, directors, made by people who have made the choice to become actively involved, to see how those decisions and actions may impact people who have decided not to be as actively involved. And to be able to imagine that before those decisions are made. Of course, you'll probably never have a perfect hindsight, but it just gives you a way to think about, to try on the hats of different people and see, um, see how they might react. Next one is to be able to plan communication activities and opportunities for people at all levels. Because people have different needs and motivations, they're going to respond to different kinds of communication, uh, different kinds of media, different kinds of activities that will be interesting to them. Uh, where some people would be very interested in coming out to the annual meeting, there's going to be a whole lot of people who that is never going to appeal to them. Uh, but they might be a lot more interested in coming to a harvest festival or a, a spring membership dance, or a picnic in the summer. So there may be other ways to, to satisfy people who are seeking a, a sense of belonging, or want to be a part of the co-op community, but just aren't as interested in being a part of the governance and decision-making part. So the model can help you find different ways of, of creating activities and, and methods for communicating. That can allow you to set goals, allocate resources, and evaluate um, how effective you've been at, at reaching and communicating with different types of members, remembering that the goal is that they get to decide at their level of involvement. Um, we're just hoping that they will be satisfied and enjoy their interaction with the co-op at whatever level they've chosen to participate. So being curious about their satisfaction level knowing that they need to be satisfied at one level before they'll be motivated to move up. And once again, the club really needing to be able to satisfy the needs of the people at the base as a basic shopping experience being the most important form. If people, if we're not meeting their needs as customers, it's unlikely they're going to join and, and it's unlikely they're going to be more involved. 
So those are some of the uses uh, you can apply the model to. And then I want to uh, invite Amy to, to share a little bit about what they've done at the Lexington Co-op and how they've used the model. Hey, Marilyn, oh. could I suggest yes. that you put the, the pure the model back on the screen while Amy talks so people can just see that as the visual? Sure. Okay, um, I'm going to start with just a little bit of background on Lexington Co-op. Um, we're a fairly typical co-op in that we're about 30 years old, and we started off as a bulk buying, um, all members worked type situation, and over the years that has shifted, and over the past five to seven years we've gone through some fairly big changes. Um, we moved from a side street where we were a small co-op and kind of a funky store um, with a membership of member owners probably under 800 um, to a brand new home which we built, um, got member, member loans and different financing to build it in a very high profile area um, in a thriving district in Buffalo. So we really changed a lot of our identity when we did that and now um, are over 4,000 member owners. Um, at the same time as we grew, um, we had to make some significant changes in that we ended our member work program, um, which caused some serious distress among uh, a group of member owners that had been around for a while and saw that as losing some of our identity. Um, and so we were wrestling with new members, uh, people who've been around for a long time, and, and as Marilyn said, we were wrestling with some of the different levels of involvement. Um, and I'd say the overall problem was that people were feeling a sense of dissatisfaction um, and how they were able to communicate their feelings and be involved in the decision-making process and felt that there was a lack of transparency. Um, at the board level and the management level, we were doing the typical strategies of having open meetings, um, information in the newsletter, but we weren't targeting any specific groups. We were just kind of scattershot throwing it out there. The board was involved, but not actively engaged in the process. We would participate, but we didn't have a real plan put together. And then we would do the occasional survey to see how people felt about things, and we would use that information to make decisions. And, and we were recognizing that there was this problem disconnect and that we needed to do something to, to revise um, and improve our owner engagement model and, and how we implemented it. So in 2008, we we're looking at our economic benefits program. Um, we're still using the discount model, 2% as a, as a register and 10% for seniors. And we wanted to end that potentially and to implement our patronage dividend system and different economic benefits that we felt um, would benefit our member owners better than the, more than the 2% had. So um, we decided to use that as our topic around which we were going to design an owner engagement model. And Marilyn came to work with us at our retreat and presented um, the level of involvement to us. And we were able to step back and really take a look at our member owner base in very different ways and identify that people wanted different levels of engagement. We couldn't try to squeeze them all into using the same method of trying to communicate with them. And also, you know, at the board level, we, we'd wrestled for a long time with, with the idea of is someone who participates in meetings, is their voice more relevant than someone who never comes to anything? And some people thought yes, some people thought no. And, and there, there was some tension within the board about whose voice was important, how we should address it. And once we were able to break it out and understand that people are going to participate in, in different ways and that that's okay, and that we needed to change our strategy of how we were going to engage with them and interact with them, a lot of the, the problems in the, the board went away because we were able to clarify that. So at the retreat, which was with uh, management staff and for, on the Friday night session, and then the next day we met with just management staff that was going to be working more specifically with the engagement program. Um, we broke out into different set groups, and each group took on a different level of engagement and involvement to develop strategies they thought would be appropriate 
for that specific group. Um, and we took a whole day brainstorming that and presenting that and rating whether or not we felt that that was really hitting the mark and then also talking about where we felt we should prioritize, knowing that we could come up with tons of great ideas, but that we only had a certain level of capacity and that we had to prioritize and hope to hit as, as touch base with as many people as we could. Um, and our goal coming out of that was that as we went through revising our economic benefits program, that all member owners would have heard about what we were going to do and what we were planning to do that they understood what we were planning to do and that they had a chance to, um, to put in their comments on that, um, knowing that most wouldn't, but that at least they'd had the opportunity. And we decided we were going to do this in a pretty aggressive time frame in a six-month period. Um, as we came out of the retreat, we still were just a, had just gone through the brainstorming session. So then it really took the next several board meetings um, management staff came in and we worked together on, as I said, prioritizing and honing it and saying what our expectations were and what we really wanted to get out of this. And then board asked the general manager and his team to come back to us with a plan of how they felt the best way we could implement this within our level of capacity um, and bring it back to us at the, at the next meeting, which they did, and they did a fantastic job, and I think that's always a good lesson for us to learn is that um, we have fantastic staff and that we should let them do what they do best and then um, have, have chances for, to be engaged and have input, but kind of stay out of the way sometimes and let, let them do their job because they do a, a really great job. Um, and so they brought that back to us and we were able to, to make some comments on it and figure out where it made sense for the board to be highly engaged in the process and leading the process. And that, that was a little bit different for us because we hadn't necessarily led the process in the past. And I think that was one of the, the missing links and we took much more responsibility for it um, under this program. We felt that in order to kick this off and to get the ball rolling that we were dealing with pretty technical issues, understanding how cooperatives work, finances of cooperatives, benefit programs, patronage dividends, but the people that would probably be able to give us the best feedback immediately and could help us develop this program better would be our active members, our active owners that were at the top level of the, of the triangle. Um, so we looked to um, people who'd given us member loans, former board members, our big shoppers, and former member workers, some of the people that were still pretty upset over ending that program. Um, we looked to them first to engage with them in a series of small meetings. And we, it was invitation only. Uh, we sent them letters and then we called them to say, please come to one of these sessions. We'd love to have your feedback on this. This is not a done deal. This is what we're thinking about doing. And we'd really like to have you help us. Number one, give us feedback on whether or not you feel uh, this is something we should move forward with and give us feedback on maybe how you would do it a little differently and any feedback on that. And also, how effectively we were communicating this. Was it hitting the mark? Was it, was it understandable? And then in, in the broader sense, we were asking them to give us feedback on this new engagement model that we had developed. So we, we had a fantastic response to that, uh, much more so than if we just had a general please come meeting. It was just a personalized invitation. We, um, we, they filled up, the sessions filled up within two days, and we had to turn a lot of people away, which definitely created a level of excitement. And when we were in these meetings, it was very up close and personal, um, but it was very good. I think people felt very comfortable expressing how they felt. It wasn't all comfortable. It, you know, some tough, tough topics came up, but we were able to get a, a very good sense. And I think the most important thing that happened out of this is that member owners talked to each other. Uh, it wasn't just voicing what they felt to the board members and to management. It was talking to each other and understanding where each of them was coming from and everybody's different levels of, of involvement and their ability, uh, something that came up a lot was affordability in times right now people were very concerned about the affordability issue at, at the co-op and 
they felt that as prices were going up, all they saw was the big new building and the beautiful place to shop and felt that that was, was uh, what was driving prices up. And, and we were able to clarify how the co-op fits within the context of the larger economy. From that session, we then did a, a multi-tiered approach of reaching out to member owners. Um, it was a whole series of newsletter articles that came both from the board, from, from me, from the board president, from the general manager, from the staff members, um, talking about both patronage dividend and ending discounts, and then talking about how we wanted to, to set up some economic benefits only available to members, because we hadn't done that in the past, um, that really made, could make their shopping experience much more affordable, because that's what we were hearing is the support for people. So we have come out of this with developing a, a basic program um, for people to shop the basics at a less expensive price. And it also was an incentive for people to become member owners that weren't. Um, we also developed some different brochures that talked about the different topics. And we did a lot of bag stuffing on those. Had a lot of information on the, on the internet. Um, we had group emails. We have our input forms at the, at the co-op. and. Uh, board email. That was all of our kind of written uh, uh, avenues for reaching out to people. Uh, in addition to our small meeting uh, for our active members, we had a larger meeting of all member owners about halfway through the process and told people that was an opportunity for them to come and, and voice or ask questions or voice their concerns. Um, kind of what, was, what I felt was great was by that point, People were coming up to me on the street that had never talked to me about the co-op before and were talking to me about what we were doing in a very non-threatening way. It wasn't just when people were upset. It was that, oh, they thought it was a great idea or some questions about it. And so I felt there was um, a much less kind of hostile atmosphere around people being able to, to give their feedback on something and to, to let us know what they felt about things. It was a very much more positive uh, experience. Um, and we also tabled at our member appreciation day. And as Marilyn talked about, sometimes people don't want to come to the regular meeting, but they'll come to something that's fun where there's food and there's a lot of social involvement. And so we started being more active at those types of situations. So we had tables there where we could talk to people about both that and any other topic they wanted to talk to us about, but we were really focused on, on patronage dividends and economic benefits. Um, and then we also did do a survey. And we didn't just survey people to ask them uh, for their input on uh, what kinds of benefits they would like to have. We asked them, we went back to what our original goal was of understanding what their level of understanding of what we were doing was. Um, and so we were asking them questions about, have they heard about this? Were they aware of it? Did they understand it? Did they have any other questions? So that we could see if we were really on the mark with how we were reaching out to people. Um, we then, over the six month process period, we were able to, of course, figure out that there were gaps in our plan um, where we felt we missed the mark a little bit. Um, and so we had to back up. And, and we also realized that board members and uh, the general manager were looking at it a little bit differently. Um, and so it gave us the opportunity to work through that. Um, no one was coming at it from a, a bad perspective or a wrong perspective. We just had different perspectives on it. Um, we were able to stay on, on task and on our goal. And, and we just at this last board meeting did make the decision to end the discounts at the register and to implement our patronage dividend system. And we have this fantastic. Uh, plan for member benefits that I think people are going to be very happy with and very excited about. And we will be announcing it at our annual meeting, which is at the end of this month, um, and implementing it after the first of the year. And we'll also be announcing it with the newsletter. But as I said, I think overall, this is a much more positive interaction of member owners interacting with each other, board, with staff. And our plan is to, as we move into what our focus topic is going to be for 2009, we plan to use this model again, understanding that we'll need to tweak it for different, 
different topics, but that it's a much more a proactive and positive way to interact with them around it. Um, Marilyn, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted me to touch on. Oh, that was great, Amy. Thanks so much. It, it has been really fun to, to be able to watch the Lexington Co-op Board rethink how they communicate with members and think more strategically about that. So thank you, Amy, so much for sharing that. Uh, do we have uh, uh, questions, Mark? Yes, and first I'd just like to encourage people to send in their, their questions, and we're using the GoToWebinar toolbar, um, so um, please, please type away. We have one that's, um, that's asking for a summary of the member owner benefits that you ended up, uh, or that you're going to be implementing. Ah, uh -huh. now I have to remember what they all are. <laughs> um, it's kind of a blend of everyday discounts on items brown rice, employee products, things that kind of a, everybody at the basic level wants to buy and needs it more affordable. So this is only going to be available to member owners, and then we'll have some that will be monthly specials. Um, we also have had a bulk buying program, but yeah, it was kind of cryptic to understand how to use it, and uh, we're going to have that be a priority so that it's more accessible to people. Um, and I can't do it justice to what our program is that our general manager developed, but I think it's something we could make available um, for people to look at. Strategy. Amy, I have another question for you. Do you have any idea how many people that you heard from during the process and meetings uh, via letters and emails, etc.? My my estimate was that we heard from over a thousand people in a lot of different forms. One of the, and one of the best ways we heard from people, of course, is always our people at the register. Fantastic people working up there at the front end. And anytime anyone made any comments about it or asked any questions, they wrote it down. Um, so that was a great way to get feedback from people in a real quick way. Um, so yeah, I think it's over a thousand people. And about how many members do you have? Um, we're close to 4,500. All right, well, Marilyn, those are the questions that I have in the queue. And um, as we move ahead, folks, please feel free to send them in. If your GoToWebinar uh, question answer toolbar is not open, you need to click the triangle next to the letter Q in the word question, and that expands it out for you. OK, Marilyn. Hey, thanks, Mark. I'll just um, uh, summarize that one of, one of the things that we hope that this model and thinking about different levels of involvement will help help board members avoid getting stuck at one extreme or another. On a continuum, I, I imagine an extreme where one end is inaction or lack of confidence or in, inability to make decisions because directors do represent the member owners and, and you'll never know what all the members want. You'll never have all the information that you need. And that's true. The model isn't going to solve that, um, but we hope that it will help you realize that you can get more information that you have than, than you have today and be able to imagine more uh, perspectives than you had today. Or at the other end of the continuum where, since you don't know what all the members want, to just make decisions based on what the, what the directors want, recognizing that you're you're probably more active and have different needs and motivations than core members. So uh, hoping to use the model to, to think about your work, the decisions you make as directors uh, from a place of being able to have access to more perspectives than, than just the ones around the, the board table, and also develop plans and strategies to hear from more people than you do today. And Marilyn, I have so a follow-up question if you want to. It's for, for Amy. Uh, Amy, what's the composition of your board in terms of length of service and how many are there? And then I have one follow-up question uh, based on that. Um, we have nine board members. Um, it's a mix. We have one person that's been on for 10 years, um, and we have some newbies. We do have contested elections. Um, this year we have six people running for three positions. We've had contested elections for probably the past five years. And 
um, can you look back and, and kind of identify the moment when um, the board was able to reach agreement on moving ahead with this process? And what was it that allowed that to happen? Um, I really think it was in, the, in our retreat when it just seemed to make so much sense when we stopped trying to figure out which voices to listen to and realized that there was opportunities to listen to everyone's voice and, and that everyone was important. And I think we were just really frustrated up till then that we felt like we were reaching out to people, but we, we weren't getting the feedback we needed and to recognize, oh, there's a way we can do this that will be much more effective. And it's kind of an aha moment. So I would say it really was at our retreat when we could sit down and, and take some time to think it through. Thanks for that. And are any of your directors also employed by the co-op? No, um, staff is not allowed to serve on the board. Thanks. Marilyn, that's it. Okay, good, thanks. Well, uh, next I want to uh, reintroduce uh, Allison and, and Kelly. Allison with um, uh, Milkshake Media and Kelly with NCGA to share uh, a whole different way of looking at how to think about uh, member and customer needs and motivations. So take it away. Hi, everybody. This is Allison. Thank you for the time and the opportunity to be here. Before we get to this first slide, uh, what I'd like to say, just, just to get everybody's mind, mindset uh, in a different spot because we are doing a different approach than the previous presentation. The purpose of this is to really talk about co-op consumers, uh, the core group, their mindsets, values, and beliefs, and additionally, the mid-level group, both millennials and boomers, which I'll get into, their mindsets and beliefs, to really see the commonalities in order to, you know, to, to broaden the reach and the audience. And uh, at the end of the day, there's some good news. We'll get to that. But that's really the point of this conversation. Um, also, it's import, important to share that we did do some primary and secondary research to get to this point. Um, some of this information probably won't be uh, brand new to you, at least with the current uh, core community perception. So uh, it's just important to tell you that, you know, there was some, some research done to help validate what we're, what we're saying today. So the slide that we have about the core group, and I'm not going to read every, uh, everything that's on the slide, but it's really just to talk about some of the things that this core group, um, some of their experiences, some of their values, some of the conversations they have, and again, you guys are probably familiar with some of these, but some of the, the things that this core group overall, um, some of the things they have in common. They grew up in a family that, go, that has gone to food co-ops. Uh, they have an increased interest in health due to key life events. Uh, they're into social equality, responsibility, self-sufficiency and localism, personal health and well-being. Um, as far as uh, some values and symbols, per, symbols per se, uh, things that you would see them all sharing, you know, alternative transit, uh, reusable bags and member numbers, shopping at co-ops and farmer markets, maybe some of the conversations this core group would be having with each other, conversations span the green universe from local involvement to personal wellness, co-op activities, food tips, green building, et cetera. Um, as far as some of the actions they all take, they're conscious dollar voting at the co-ops, um, they're purchasing specific products, they're talking about the co-op, and really they're recognized as leaders within the, the co-op community. So that's really the core group. Now when we talk to, uh, the next slide, when we talk to mid-level millennials, uh, which is very different than the mid-level boomers, there's some differences and similarities which we'll get to, but this younger group of millennials uh, in summary, this group, they connect with local, uh, they make the correlation to fresh produce being grown locally, however, they don't think about the concept of contributing to a local economy or the principles of cooperation, which, is in, which was interesting. They do like the idea of fresh uh, local produce, which they associate with farmer markets, and they really like the idea of, of giving back to the community, and this, again, is 18 to 30-year-old uh, group of individuals. Now, to this group, the, co the existing co-op environment, the physical look and feel, uh, is not as appealing to them because they're in the, the world of retail environments where everything is pristine and perfect. So they're, 
their experience is that is, of co-ops is it's a dark place, uh, a little dingy, and when they're used to this brightly lit aisles and gorgeous displays. And um, one of the participants, which was in a focus group, said co-ops have the right values, just the wrong package. And again, this was the younger group of millennials. Now moving to the next slide, which was the mid-level boomers, and this is the group that's um, an older generation, this group tended to be more concerned with their health and wellness. Uh, some of that could be, you know, due to age. They think in holistic terms about their health. This includes food, exercise, green products, etc. Uh, they have an old-fashioned view of the co-op, which makes them more tolerant of its unique vibe. Uh, they do like, they have to admit that they do like a well-designed store, but they uh, get why the co-op is why it is. Uh, the boomers value uh, values align in a meaningful way with what the co-op is doing. Uh, they understand the bigger picture, and they are voting with their wallets. They do understand the complexities of the local economy and walk the talk when it comes to supporting local business. And the big thing for this group, this, these mid-level boomers, is that they're into supporting and developing a sense of community. Um, so when you take it to the next slide, really the opportunity from a consumer base for co-ops is really understanding the differences of the core and the mid-level. But if you look in that box, that gray box that's in the middle of the page, there are a few themes that resonate. And these are the things and the opportunities um, of both the core and the mid-level that we need to focus on, because this is where the opportunities are, where these perceptions overlap. And these perceptions are you know, quality food, so these are the things that they all have in common, supporting local, health and nutrition, and community. So these four perceptions, as we try to broaden the audience and understand the mindset and the mind share of the co-op consumer, these are the four things um, as, a, as, a, as a board you can consider as you move forward uh, making decisions. So. I don't know, Kelly, if there's anything you would like to add. I said that pretty quickly, so I apologize if I went too fast. Yeah, well, I think just I'd give some background. I'm sorry, I probably should have done the training before the conversation, is that um, we have been working with Milkshake Media and CGA in order to uh, take another look at the branding and the uh, programs and services that we offer to our food co-op members. And so uh, this process and this research is really intended to support our ongoing activities, how we're structuring the, oper um, the operational level, the marketing support materials that we provide to members, and um, again, with the intent to being to make sure we're not alienating our core group of co-op consumers or the core wellness consumers, but reaching out to folks in a way that broadens appeal to those mid-level consumers who may not be shopping the co-op regularly, who may, um, you know, be ripe for us to, in terms of the messages that we can put out in increasing their appeal. And so that's sort of the framework of what we were what we we're trying to do there. Origin of all of this work. Okay. Uh, Kelly or Allison, could you give us a little picture of the core and mid-level consumer? Just to help us sure, I'll take that. Okay, thanks. Um, when we talk about uh, core and mid-level consumers, we're really referring to uh, a model developed by the Hartman Group. And it really talks of, through um, the demographics and psychographics of people as they relate to wellness. And so a core wellness consumer is really one that is very invested in uh, health and wellness, somebody who exercises, who chooses organic frequently, who shops at farmers markets, who, who um, knows a lot about the source of their food, who seeks information, um, and is very invested, you know, in the direct link between food and health. Um, those shoppers are more likely to be shopping uh, in co-ops. Looking at mid-level consumers, they are, uh, again, consumers who may be, have a recent interest in uh, health and wellness, whether it's um, new families, uh, having new babies, um, they've been diagnosed with maybe uh, some medical condition which requires that they take a, a new look at the foods that they eat and 
um, how they're treating their bodies from a, a food and health perspective. So these people may or may not be shopping at co-ops. They may be shopping at other natural food stores. They may be shopping at their more conventional grocery store and shopping their natural and organic foods best. Again, with that interest um, just emerging in how they can uh, live a healthier life through the food choices that they make. Um, Kelly or Allison, I wanted to know if we could go back to this slide and, and see if you could speak a little bit more to the part that's in the middle and what that means. The belonging, enduring, and connecting. Sure. These are the thir these are the three main things that we believe really connect brands and and to community to communities to build brands. And what that means for co-ops is the first stage would be belonging through experiences and values. And then once, once a group of people belong to something, then they connect. And, and how they connect is through symbols, by identifying people or by conversations. And then finally how you, you, you build a sense of community is through enduring, which is really through actions of doing and basically walking walking the walk and talking the talk, and then eventually getting rewarded. So we believe that uh, people come into, you know, a brand is what we, we call it, through, the, through this, this area of belonging. And that's, um, that's where we talked about, you know, they grew co-op members that grew up in a family that go, you know, have gone through co-op, their progressive politics. This is just kind of their their experience and their history and, and how they belong to this group. Does that make sense? And it, yes. Yeah, and I would add to that, this is Kelly, that um, what we're really looking at is how do we ensure that this, you know, chain continues to be unbroken and that we're bringing, um, looking at this framework from not only this core perspective that you see here, but adding in um, the perspectives of the mid-levels, both the millennials and the boomers, and finding ways um, to make sure that we are building the connections, um, making it easy for people to find each other through conversations and through symbols, and then um, providing the appropriate reward mechanisms. And reward, you know, is not necessarily in the literal uh, tangible sense with respect to we're going to give them something, um, but, it, you know, it could be just the, the personal um, sense of, of value that they find in bringing a new shop to the co-op, for example, mm -hmm. and persuading somebody to be a member, and just having an opportunity to uh, talk about uh, health and wellness and, you know, the connections that, that they make in why uh, local sustainable agriculture is really important with others. So that's really, you know, what this process is about, is finding those things that are meaningful across a broader uh, group of people so that we, in our messaging and our marketing, uh, to shoppers of the co-op and others in a broader community sense um, are, are really finding the value and not the values rather not just the sort of the value that we provide. Good. Thank you both so much. Um, I want to ask Art now if he would um, take some time and tell us a little bit about how he's used this, this kind of work to help serve their consumers at the, at the Berkshire Co-op Market. Art? Okay. Hi, everybody again. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background about Berkshire Co-op Market. Approximately, you know, actually next week will be four years to the date. Um, Berkshire Co-op was in a very small basement location um, in the back end of town on a dead-end street. We were doing close to $2 million a year in sales and we had a much higher percentage of our shopper from the core group at that time. I don't have scientific evidence for that, but I'm, I'm sure that that's correct. Four years later, um, after we've relocated, we have approximately 25 to 2,600 members. We, four years ago, had eight to 900 members. Uh, we're doing close to $7.5 million in sales, and we're on the verge of outgrowing our new location. Uh, previously at the old location we also did we, we did yearly member drives and we actually made the decision when we moved to our new location to not do member drives um, in spite of that 
we average six to eight new members a week, and we estimate that it takes the average new member three to six visits at our co-op before they decide to become members. So we're trying to track that better, but we're finding some of those results pretty interesting because we made a conscious effort four years ago to not approach the core exclusively um, as a co-op. We, we knew that we had that audience, but we felt that it was far more important to think of what a co-op really is other than the financial matter, and, and, and that's a, a business that's connected with its community and that hopefully understands the needs of the community and becomes a center of the community. So from a grocery standpoint, we kind of want it to be um, the grocery store answered to the bar chairs where everybody knows your name. And so we approached it from really a customer service standpoint where it was important to us that our staff were well educated about the products, that they stopped and listened when a customer spoke to them, that they gave excellent customer service, and when somebody bought our food that it was delicious. Nothing more complicated than that. So it's really back to basic to running a good organization. I also recognized that our board of directors certainly represented more of the core than potentially our new shoppers when we moved to our new location. And we certainly talked about that, and, and I asked them to give us a little time um, to see how we did with a different kind of approach. In fact, when we first moved here, we had people coming in from the downtown for our lunch choices, and it was hard for me to believe, but some of them didn't know what tofu was and hadn't even eaten tofu. And instead of wondering what this weird product was and, and leaving, they gave it a shot and they would come back for lunch because, again, it simply tasted good or we were able to give good customer service. We are very careful when we have events and, 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 and special programs in the town to decide ahead of time who we're trying to reach. And um, I think somebody mentioned earlier that we have annual meetings. Uh, we also run a, a community event for the town called Summer Solstice. Uh, Summer Solstice, we get maybe three to 4,000 people who pass through the event during the day. It's, it's, it's on a big ball field. We certainly table the event, and we have other organizations help us that are symbiotic to the co-op. But, you know, there's also good music, and there's kids' events, and anybody can enjoy it whether you have cooperative values or not. Annual meeting is an occasion for our members, and my first annual meeting at the old location, we had 30 people come to annual meeting, and we fed them too. And now the challenge that we have is that we're running out of places to hold our annual meeting because we get between three and 400 people. Um, so we certainly have an investment among our members, but more importantly, our new members are joining because they approach us and ask us what it is that we're trying to do, what sets us apart from another store, and they do this after they've become familiar with us. Um, so it's a more sustainable membership as well. We have changed the way that we table at events. You know, if the local yoga center was doing a health fair, you, you know, the co-op was always there. Um, and half the people who came to our table were people that we already knew and that were members. And so we've made a concerted effort to not only reach out to the mid-level, but beyond the mid-level. And so, for example, the local fire department recently had an event that talked about emergency planning, and they, you know, had a rescue um, presentation. And we showed up there to table, and even though we've been around for years in this community, uh, we were swamped with people who really weren't that familiar with the co-op and thought we were the weird hippies that wore Birkenstocks. Um, we talked a little bit about the food, we had a few samples, and everybody who works in our store noticed over the last, over those next couple of weeks that we saw different faces in the store. Some of those different faces were sure have become members since because it was also two to three weeks later a small bump in membership. So it gets back to running an excellent operation within the four walls. There was an example um, used about the difference between people looking for local 
but only the core understanding the local economy connection. And frankly, we understand that here at Berkshire Co-op, and we're okay with it. We make it very easy for our consumers to find the local product. We have photos of local farmers, and we are now putting photos in for local producers into the other aisles. Um, it's passive examples. We don't hit people over the head with it. Um, when people come up to us and ask us about local, with one-on-one -on -one conversations, we're able to talk more about local economy, or we put articles in our newsletter, or we uh, get frequent requests from the local radio station or the Rotary Club to come in and talk about local, and that's when we try to make the pitch for local economy and talk more about cooperatives. But in the store, again, we get back to focusing on the product that people are asking for, and if we do a good job there, our membership will come. We also decided four years ago that we really needed to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. If we said that we were going to be part of our community, we needed to be part of our community. And as, as an example, I'm a director on our local chamber of commerce. I, or now that I have a marketing manager, we do go to rotary meetings. We participate in the more established organizations in the town. We don't play a heavy hand in politics, but when we're talking about things like smart growth, we will be at those meetings. Um, it takes a different level of commitment. And, and I ask my board of directors in particular, if I'm trying to keep the pulse on the community and find out what's going on, I will try to ask individual board members to accompany me at some of these events or, or to be at these events depending on their expertise. Uh, we really want the community to think of the co-op as um, a true business that is interested in enhancing the community and we can talk about the cooperative principles later. Let me look down my list. I made some quick notes here. The, again, I'll get back to the piece of, of, of a well-educated staff. Um, again, it was mentioned that often our customers will engage with our cashiers, for example. And sometimes our cashiers don't have the right answers, but they always know who to turn to. Part of my job, half my day, is just going to the store, engaging with our customers. And, and most of our management team do the same thing. We also want our shoppers and our members to, to, again, passively know that we do things different. We do have member appreciation days in the store a few times a year, and that's a type of event that is specifically geared to our members. And because of that, uh, often we will have at least one board director, maybe sometimes more, in the store during member appreciation days. And they don't do anything more complicated than walk down the aisle and introduce themselves and say, hey, I'm a director, what do you think? You know, um, no, no plan of attack, no speeches, nothing like that. Again, when we want to reach members, we have specific events, but we've also made conscious decisions so that the person who comes into our store for the first time when they leave the store, when they're standing in line and they look up at the wall in front of them, they will see the cooperative principles when they have a moment to look. But they may not see a lot about cooperatives as they walk through the store. Um, what we do instead, though, or actually what we don't do, even to take that to a, a, a second point, we don't even have member-only sales in, in our store. At least we don't sign them. We might throw a coupon into a newsletter, um, but we don't want the average consumer to feel like this is an exclusive entity. We've finally overcome that perception that you have to be a member to shop in a co-op. And I'm not saying that this is right or wrong, but the decision we made here at the co-op is that we wouldn't have exclusive members-only programs going on on a daily basis, that we would reserve those programs for those days that are more geared towards our membership. And we do think that that's helped tremendously, that people look upon us first as a neighborhood store that hopefully has the answers. We now know that our neighbors and our community, when there's a food problem, um, 
or a warning will call us sometimes first, and we love that so that they now trust us. And again, a lot of those people have now become members, and we are seeing significant increases in our membership, and, and those numbers that I gave you earlier are actually climbing every year. Um, this year at annual meeting on November 1st, we will be reincorporating as a uh, true cooperative. Right now we're a nonprofit, and we've held three local meetings for our members. We got actually a pretty low attendance. We got about 60 to 70 people between the three meetings, and that's not terrific when we're talking about a membership of over 2,000. However, for the last month, Every day that you go into the co-op, you can see one-on-one -on -one conversations with staff and members who are asking individually. When I ask people why they aren't coming to the uh, meetings, I either hear, because we know we can get the answer here in person, or we trust what you're doing, or getting back to core and mid-level, I don't really care that much. And again, that's okay with us. We don't feel bad about that. We don't feel guilty. Um, it's been a tough lesson to learn that those who are sometimes approach things from the most negative and the most vehement are also the core members of, of, of our co-ops. In the last three years, we've had six people decide not to be members any longer, um, and all six were very core. And there was one member, for example, who was outraged um, that we sell, still sell bottled water because water isn't a commodity. It's not our place to agree necessarily or to disagree, but to give a member a, a, an answer and hopefully options and let them make up their own minds. We are a voluntary organization. So in that case, for example, and, and this is just one little example, in our water section where you can buy bottled water, there's a sign that says we have a reverse osmosis machine as a discounted price, and you can go back there and get purified water instead of buying bottled water. Um, we don't preach, we don't remove things from the shelf as long as they're natural foods, and that's part of our mission, we will carry it. But to enhance our values, um, for example, our coffee is fair trade, or those products that might be more eco-friendly or more pure might be at eye level, or when we run our sale programs during the month in addition to our cap sale programs, we focus on local and make sure that that product is displayed at, at eye level. So by using the natural shopper tendencies, we can affect sales and enhance our value, and that will resonate with those mid-level consumers who are ready to take the next step uh, to be more of a core level. The final point that I think I'll make is that um, as the economy goes south and people get more nervous about the economy, we've seen this happen before, that shopper habits change. And they actually end up trying to, they, they, they reconnect with family, and they shop at those places that are most comfortable. And so we're looking at statistics now. They're showing declining sales at places like Whole Foods and even Walmart, and yet many co-ops are seeing significant growth because, again, it's nothing more than trying to be somebody's neighbor and listening and being aware of, of those who are a little afraid of what's happening and using a little bit of kindness um, to address the mid-level, and they'll become our core. And I think I said probably more than enough. Thank you so much, Art. I really appreciate your, your coming on and sharing the stories at Berkshire Co-op. Uh, so I um, believe there are a few questions, Mark. Do you want to um, bring true. them in for you? Yep. Kelly um, or Allison uh, or Art? So these uh, first two came in uh, related to Allison and Kelly's um, presentation. If, um, uh, and, and they're related, so I'll give them to you both at the same time. If you had one message to attract the greatest number of new customers in a market area, what might it be? And the follow-up question is, and would that be a different message than the one you'd pitch to convert customers to members? So I, I think I'll take that question, this is Kelly, um, because we're not quite there yet. The next step in our process is to take these sort of four areas of uh, overlap that speak to the mid-level without alienating the core. And again, it's really important that um, the messages that we create 
do both of those things um, is to take this into a succinct message. So I don't have an answer on what is the one thing I'd say today. I'd say that in the messaging that you should be emphasizing always at least one of these four points. And um, with respect to um, converting uh, shoppers to members, I, I guess I'm just going to give my personal opinion because we haven't done a lot of research on this, but I think it's really an individual path that everybody, you know, is going to uh, approach membership from a different place. And I think as Marilyn um, shared earlier, there are people who will never want to belong on that level, and that has to be okay with us as co-ops. Um, the con you know, what we need to do, our responsibility on an operational level is to communicate what our co-op's about, make it easy for people to find information, make it easy for them to understand what the benefits are of being a member, and that's both, you know, tangible and intangible benefits in terms of what they support, and make sure that that is accessible and easy for them to find so that at the point where they feel comfortable on a personal level of making that transition from shopper to member, um, we've done our job and it's easy for them to, to make that decision. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Marilyn, I think I'll direct this one to you and then you can uh, decide how you want to uh, distribute it. Um, how are boards of directors using ENDS policies and governance policies to increase member communications? Oh, that's a really good question. And I think uh, both of the clubs that are participating today, um, Lexington and, and Berkshire, have given some good thought to, uh, to it in crafting policy and, and in deciding how the board's going to do its work, really thinking about the broad range of members that they're trying to serve. Um, Amy, I might ask you to address that first, if you would, and talk a little bit about about the uh, conversation that you all have had about your your ends policies of, about meeting both member and non-member needs, if you would. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we just revised our ends policy last year um, and went from having three pages you know, kitchen sink was thrown in there, I think, to a, a very succinct um, lead-in paragraph with, with four bullets and, and the lead-in says that we are serving member and, and non-member needs. Um, and we just did a check-in uh, a year later after putting that in place is, is that is that um, it hitting the mark for us um, because we were looking at that uh, we wrestled with our just talked about we wrestled with um, the idea of having member only specials and uh, so we had the conversation around it and I think came to the, the conclusion um, that we still want it to be about members and non-members because we are such a vital point, part of the community and so much of it is about uh, community. One of the things that we've done as we've gone through this process is we have tweaked some of our policies um, where we felt there were gaps. We were trying to still stay very high level and not necessarily be descriptive but we felt that we weren't adequately planning for certain issues and that we wanted to make sure that there was a built-in mechanism to have plans for how we were going to communicate with, with member owners around uh, hot bus issues. And so that, I think, was easier for the general manager to understand, you know, why we were frustrated at times that he'll be able to uh, be more proactive in, in coming to us with any changes he's going to implement or to need us to make decisions on that will have a, a better plan laid out. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the planning process that we've now implemented in general around member owners. I'll throw it over to you, Art. I don't know if you want to... I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw it over to you now to talk about policy. Well, I, I, I think th there's always that um, very friendly push and shove between the board and, and, and the general manager or whoever your operational leader is. Um, and as long as – I don't have a specific answer except to say that when, when I feel personally at a board meeting that a board director is approaching ends or particular policies from a personal matter rather than representing what – the average member might want, I'm, 
comfortable pointing it out, and I hope that they're the same. I, I think we sometimes have to, it, again, it's pretty simple, just remind ourselves in those conversations when we all have strong opinions to remember what our ultimate role is. And I don't think it's that important, even through ends, to differentiate what you're trying to do with members versus non-members, because in general, all our co-ops are trying to enhance and improve our communities, and what should be good for our members should be good for our community anyway. One of the things that I might add for the, the Berkshire Co-op is that when they, they moved from the, the basement back alley store that Art told you about four or five years ago, they made a, a conscious decision at that point that they really wanted to, to, to appeal to a much broader group of members. I mean, clearly, before, without much visibility, it was only people who were really dedicated, loyal customers who would seek them out and, and be able to find them. But once they were on, on uh, in, in the main part of downtown, they had a lot more visibility, and they, they really wanted to take advantage of that and to serve a much broader segment of their community. And so they did write an INS policy, or write a policy as part of the INS that they redid at that time to speak to diversity and to to be clear that in in this relocation that they wanted to serve uh, an, an increasingly broad group of members to make uh, and customers and to make the, the benefits of the store and benefits of ownership available to a, a much more diverse and much broader set of consumers than they had been able to or or had done in the previous location. Thank you. That was a much better answer than mine. And, and, and to reiterate, we actually have significantly increased our core by specifically not targeting our core, which is interesting. Uh, would you say that again, maybe a little bit differently, Art? I'm not sure I followed okay. it. Uh, when we, we made the decision that we would broaden our scope and get back to some basics of just running a good operation and by, by not specifically targeting our core, our core is actually growing from the mid-level conversions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions, Mark? Uh, no, no more questions. For those of you who would like to send one in, type it away. But nothing at this time. Okay, sounds good. Well, um, I think we'll, we'll uh, go around again and give each uh, person who's been a panelist a chance to make a uh, final point that they would like to make something that uh, they would say would crystallize the, the main message that that they wanted to offer here today. And um, I'll, I'll start with that and then, then move uh, through the order from Amy to Allison, Kelly, and Art. Um, the, the key point that I would like for folks to take away, if nothing else, is that uh, people are different and that's okay. That Everyone is welcome and all deserve to have their needs met, that we're not, that, that the purpose of these models is not to try to um, change people, to force them to believe what we believe or to value what we value, but to understand their needs so that we can meet them and satisfy them and, and keep them as, as um, loyal and, and engaged uh, uh, shoppers at the co-op. Uh, Amy, how about you? Would you like to summarize what you would hope people would take away? So I just wanted to add that, um, that it's always going to be a process. We're never going to necessarily get there and find the perfect way of addressing member owner engagement, um, especially because our member owners have been changing and needs are going to change. But that we can find better ways, and that's just a model for us that has left everyone more satisfied. Not everyone, but most people. Good. Thank you. Um, Allison. Yeah, I, th I think from our per go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I thought I heard something. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think from our perspective, it's just important to know, um, like everyone is saying, that there is uh, a diverse group of co-op consumers out there. There are um, those who are more active, and then there's are those are they're new consumers that we want to capture, and so we just need to understand the commonalities so we can uh, approach them with those commonalities so we can, can get both into the stores. Yeah, good, thanks. And Kelly? Yeah, I guess I'd 
um, echo what's been said, that you know, our job is to make people feel included, that everyone is, in fact, welcome at the co-op, that they're part of our community, and that we um, are doing everything we can to meet people where they're at, regardless of where they're at, in a way that doesn't make them feel judged or um, excluded. And Art? Again, it's, it's, you know, we need to run a good, clean, friendly operation that serves good product at fair prices, not the cheapest prices, but at fair prices, um, educate those who want to be educated, and um, the membership will come. Thank you all. Uh, just reviewing our objectives, we were hoping that you would have some new tools and resources for understanding different kinds of customers and members and what their needs and motivation might be that as directors you'd be able to test your thinking and your decision making from these various points of view um, that you might have some new ways to develop communication and linkage plans and strategies and to uh, see how you might be distinct from the majority of members and shoppers so we hope we've accomplished that we'll take one pause here uh, mark to see if there are any final questions uh, no questions. We are getting a couple of thank you notes, and I'd like to thank you all. Uh, and also point out that we have recorded this session, and I'll be posting it to the file repository uh, later today for you to download and share with others. Also, there's a, a, a companion article to the model that Marilyn presented that's available as well. Um, and Marilyn, also just a quick infomercial. We have two webinars coming up. Um, uh, dealing with complaints from members and uh, staff next week and then uh, later in October uh, life cycles and trends of cooperatives so hope that you all can uh, take advantage of those sessions as well thank you Amy Allison Kelly and Art it's so much appreciate your coming on and sharing your perspectives and experiences um, and thank all of you participants for coming have a great thank day thank you very much bye everybody Bye-bye. Uh, there will be a, a session evaluation uh, coming up on your screen as soon as we end the session and your input. Um